Welcome to your review for your final lab exam. This is for Biology 2113 or Anatomy and Physiology 1. We're going to start with the cow eye. We can see a dissection here. They've separated the eye into a front and back. We can see things like the cornea, the clear membrane through which light would first enter the eye, the sclera, the outermost layer or tunic of the eye, also called the fibrous tunic, we can see the blind spot, which is the only location the retina is attached to the back portion of the eye. The blind spot's also called the optic disc. The optic disc does not contain any photoreceptors. We can see the retina, which is this tissue paper-like structure, which is the innermost tunic of the eye. Because it contains the photoreceptors, it is also called the sensory tunic or the sensory layer. From the blind spot, we have neurons exit the back of the eye. Those axons of those neurons become the optic nerve, and the optic nerve sends visual information from the eye to your brain. We also have the lens. The lens will separate the anterior compartment from the posterior compartment. In the anterior compartment is a fluid called the aqueous humor. In the posterior compartment is a fluid called the vitreous humor. We can see the vitreous humor here. It is thick and jelly-like and maintains intraocular pressure in that posterior compartment. So it'll maintain pressure that keeps the retina on the back of the eye because the retina actually easily peels off this back portion of the eye. Here's a better image where we can see the back portion of the cornea through a space called the pupil. Lateral to the pupil is the iris, which is the colored portion of your eye. Lateral to the iris is the ciliary body, which is smooth muscle that holds the lens in place via suspensory ligaments. The ligaments attach on one side to the lens, on the other side to the ciliary body. Another name for the suspensory ligaments would be the ciliary zonule. We can see better the choroid, which we didn't see in the last image. If the retina is the innermost layer or tunic of the eye, and the sclera is the outermost layer, or tunic of the eye, the choroid would be the middle layer. The choroid is highly vascularized, so it is sometimes called the vascular layer of the eye. That means it contains blood vessels. It's also deeply pigmented. You may also know the sclera as the white of the eye, so it may help to know the sclera as either the fibrous layer or the white of your eye. We can see better how the lens is separating the back portion from the front portion of the eye. This is probably the best cross-sectional view or image to study for this PowerPoint. We can see the lens separating the anterior from the posterior compartment. We can see the retina held in place by the vitreous humor. We can see the choroid and the sclera. A structure we haven't seen in detail yet, but we'll see in an upcoming slide, is the tapetum lucidum, a shiny structure that is only seen in the eyes of cows, things like raccoons and deer, but it is not seen in the human eye. We can see the position of the ciliary body and the ligaments better and how they hold the eye in place. They also can change the shape of the eye, specifically the lens. They can flatten it or cause it to bulge and that would change the refractory beams and how they hit the retina. The pupil again is the space. The iris is the colored portion of your eye and we can see the cornea and how it will be the first structure light enters the eye through. If light were to go through this eye and try to hit the retina where all the photoreceptors are, it would pass first through the cornea, then through the aqueous humor of the anterior compartment, pass through the pupil, which is between the iris, go through the lens into the posterior compartment via or through the vitreous humor in order to hit the retina. Again, the retina contains photoreceptors, also known as the sensory tunic. The sclera is dense and tough, so it's called the fibrous tunic. And the choroid is also known as the vascular tunic because it contains blood vessels. Here is that tapetum lucidum. It's shiny, it's iridescent. It's gonna help animals in low light conditions see better. They've also removed the retina everywhere except at the optic disc where it's attached to the back of the eye and neurons leave the back of the eye to become the optic nerve. So the retina here is attached to the optic disc, also known as the blind spot. Here is a quick study sheet. We've gone over most of the structures. 
you can see the spelling for ciliary body and zonule. Ciliary body, again, is smooth muscle. Ciliary zonule is suspensory ligaments. The sclera is the outermost tunic of the eye. The choroid is the middle tunic of the eye. And the retina is the innermost tunic of the eye. Humans do not have a tapetum lucidum, but in the cow eye, it's located between the retina and the choroid. The aqueous humor is in front of the lens. The vitreous humor is behind the lens. The aqueous humor fills the anterior compartment. So aqueous with an A and anterior with an A. That can help you remember where the aqueous humor is located. The optic disc, same as the blind spot, contains photoreceptors. And we've mentioned the photoreceptors, rods and cones, but here we'll look at what they perceive. Cones perceive color or high acuity color vision, while rods are going to perceive dim light conditions or shades of gray. Next, we'll look at the different parts of the brain. If you were asked to name the four main regions or the four adult brain structures, you would list the following. The cerebral hemispheres, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Those are the four main regions of the brain. Do not include the spinal cord. The spinal cord is a part of the central nervous system made up of the brain and spinal cord, but it is not a part of the brain. There are three parts to the diencephalon and the brainstem. The three parts of the diencephalon are the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. The epithalamus also is known as the pineal gland, which secretes melatonin involved in helping you sleep or your circadian rhythms. The brainstem is made up of the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. And we can see that the midbrain is superior to the pons, and the pons is superior to the medulla oblongata. And the brainstem itself here in green is continuous with the spinal cord here in yellow. The diencephalon is in purple, and the walnut wrinkly structure, that is the left cerebral hemisphere. You actually have a left and right cerebral hemisphere separated from each other by a longitudinal fissure and only connected to each other via white matter called the corpus callosum. Next, we'll look at the spaces in the brain. These spaces are lined with ependymal cells, which have cilia. Inside these spaces, is cerebrospinal fluid, abbreviated CSF. The spaces themselves are called ventricles, and the ventricles which contain cerebrospinal fluid are going to be able to not only nourish the brain with things like proteins, potassium, calcium, sodium, the different types of ions they contain, but they're also going to be able to reduce the weight of the brain itself, allowing it to slightly float inside this watery environment. We also have cerebrospinal fluid surrounding the brain, not just inside these ventricles. You have four vein ventricles. You have one C-shaped lateral ventricle in one cerebral hemisphere, another C-shaped lateral ventricle in another cerebral he hemisphere, a third ventricle around the diencephalon, and the opening for the fourth ventricle is at the base of the cerebellum. We can see it's much wider over here in the anterior view. What connects the third and fourth ventricle as well is a canal called the cerebral aqueduct. And from the fourth ventricle, cerebrospinal fluid will flow through the spinal cord via a canal called the central canal. We're going to look at a couple of functions for different brain structures. For example, the thalamus of your diencephalon. It's going to be the train station for your brain. All information that comes to your brain needs to be sorted to its right location in the cerebral cortex must pass through the thalamus. So it's your sensory relay station. Your hypothalamus, you can associate that with homeostasis. It's going to help maintain certain body functions within a narrow range. It's not only your thirst center, but it's also going to be responsible for things like different parts of the endocrine system which secretes hormones, which regulate a lot of body functions, such as metabolism and even sleep. The epithalamus helps with that sleep because it secretes melatonin. The pineal gland itself is an endocrine gland, so melatonin is a hormone, and it's going to regulate your circadian rhythms. The midbrain of your brainstem contains the corpora quadrimina. The corpora quadrimina is made up of four bumps, 
two superior and two inferior, which are called the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. The colliculi themselves, which make up the corpora quadrumina, are going to contain your visual and auditory reflex centers, such as if someone were to drop a heavy book suddenly, or someone were to yell, these reflex centers would allow you to respond and process parts of, these, of this information. Then we have your pons, which is a conduction track or neuronal highway. It's going to be a neuronal highway between your midbrain and your medulla, but it's going to help carry information up to your cerebral cortex and then back down to your spinal cord. The medulla itself is a part of the autonomic nervous system. It relays information about heart rate, contraction force of your heart, how fast you're breathing, the rhythm of your breathing, and how deep you're breathing. It plays a small role in lung compliancy and both the fight and flight response and your rest and digestion system. But the medulla, it's important to know, contains those cardiovascular and respiratory centers. And in the cerebellum, all of its activity is gonna be subconscious, but it's involved in creating a motor blueprint for how you should carry out certain motor activity, such as what muscles should move in order to ride a bike and not fall over, or what muscles in my fingers should contract at what time to play a nice melody on a piano. Moving on, let's just take a quick look at the brainstem separately from other structures. It is, however, still sitting under the diencephalon, so this light pink structure is the diencephalon. Below that is the midbrain, then the pons, then the medulla oblongata, and then the spinal cord. We can see if we go back up to the midbrain, a superior and an inferior bump. There would be another superior and inferior bump on the other side of this structure, and that would make four bumps, two superior and two inferior, and all four together would be the corpora quadrumina, which are your auditory and visual reflex centers. Moving on, let's look more closely at the cerebrum. So you have two cerebral hemispheres, a left and right, they're connected by white matter called the corpus callosum. The ridges on your cerebrum are gyri. The valleys on the cerebrum are sulci, and I'll point that out in the upcoming slide. And the left and right hemisphere are separated by the longitudinal fissure. There's five lobes. If you've had psychology, you've probably heard of a lot of them. You have the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, and the insular lobe. The insular lobe is deep to or below the temporal lobe. Your occipital lobe is on the back of your brain. The frontal lobe is on the front of your brain. And the parietal lobe is between your occipital and frontal lobe. And it'll be medial to your temporal lobe, which is near your temples. So let's point those out. Frontal lobe in yellow, parietal lobe in pink, occipital lobe in purple, and temporal lobe in green. Under this temporal lobe would be the insular lobe. Here we see the base of the brain, but we can also see the gyri and the sulci. So these ridges on the wrinkled part of the cerebrum, the ridges are the gyri, and then these crevices made by the gyri are the sulci. Other structures we can see, the olfactory bulb, that's going to be part of one of your cranial nerves. We can see the optic nerves, which form an X shape. The X shape is called your optic chiasm or chiasma. And this is made because your right and left optic nerve cross over each other. So any information you pick up from your left eye is actually going to be processed in your right hemisphere. Any information you pick up from your right eye is actually going to be processed in your left hemisphere. And other structures we can see on the bottom view of the human brain, the pons, the medulla, and the cerebellum. You can see the cerebellum is even more wrinkly than the cerebrum and how it gets its name, little brain. Let's point out the adult structures again for the brain. So four main adult structures. We can see our wrinkly cerebrum. Right now we're looking at the right hemisphere. We can see the three structures of the diencephalon. Here's the thalamus, hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Here it's listed as the pineal gland. We can see parts of the brainstem. So we have 
the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And then last but not least, the cerebellum. What we can see here in the cerebellum is there's an inside tree-like structure, and it's gonna be lighter than the outside of the cerebellum. This structure here is cerebellar white matter called the arbor vitae. We can also see at the base of the cerebellum, the opening for the fourth ventricle. And even though it's covered by some tissue called the septum lucidum, this would be one of the openings into a lateral C-shaped ventricle. We've separated the left and right hemisphere, and so we can actually see the piece of tissue that would connect the left to the right hemisphere. That corpus callosum is right here, and the corpus callosum is the piece of white matter that would connect the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. All right, let's move forward and look at more images. Here we can see the three layers that cover the brain. There are three connective tissue layers called the meninges. The outermost meningeal layer is the dura mater. It's thick and leathery and protective. The middle layer of the meninges is the arachnoid mater. It's actually stuck just under the dura mater. They're closely associated. And the pia mater is the innermost layer of the meninges or the innermost meningeal layer and it's still attached to the brain. This saran wrap covering that appears to be on this sheep brain, that is the pia mater, which goes over the ridges and into the valleys, or over the gyri and into the sulci. You can see a covered longitudinal fissure, which is a big crevice that separates the left and right cerebral hemispheres. The frontal lobe would be towards this anterior end. Occipital lobe toward the back, near the cerebellum. And whereas in the human brain, when we were looking at the brain stem, it went from superior midbrain to pons below that, then medulla oblongata. Because of the orientation of the structures in the sheep brain, the midbrain is instead going to be more anterior than the pons, which is behind it, and then the medulla oblongata will be behind the pons, but still continuous with the spinal cord. Then we can see the temporal lobe here on the side parietal lobe up top behind the frontal lobe. Again, make sure that you know the orientation for the meninges, outermost dura mater, middle arachnoid mater, and innermost pia mater. And they are going to have cerebrospinal fluid through them. They also contain blood vessels, and they're gonna be responsible not only for protection, but circulation of that cerebrospinal fluid and information. Here we see the underside of a sheep brain. We've seen the underside of a human brain. So some of these structures will repeat. We have the optic chiasm or chiasma, olfactory bulbs, much bigger in the sheep brain because they're better at smelling things than we are. They have a better sense of smell. So compared to the size of their brain, their olfactory bulbs are huge. We have optic nerves anterior to the optic chiasma, pituitary gland the, under the hypothalamus, we can see part of the pons, part of the medulla oblongata, and the spinal cord. Again, spinal cord structure, not a part of the brain. Another part of the central nervous system instead. Here we can see things like number one is the arbor vitae, two is the cerebellum, 11 is the opening to the fourth ventricle, 24 is the pons, in front of that is the midbrain, which includes structures three and four, Structure three is a superior colliculus. Structure four is an inferior colliculus. Again, part of the midbrain. And then behind 24, this is going to be the medulla. And then at the very end would be the spinal cord. We also have the optic chiasma. Sorry, optic chiasma. That's number 23. Then you have number 18 is the hypothalamus. Above it, something that's usually very circular and a good starting point whenever you're looking at structures in the sheep brain, even the human brain, is the thalamus because of its central location and circular shape. And then number five, that's gonna be the epithalamus or the pineal body or pineal gland. We have number eight, which is an opening to a lateral ventricle, this time in the left cerebral hemisphere. Number 20 is the corpus callosum, Number 15 is the fornix. 
And then we can also see the cerebral hemisphere and a couple of other structures we pointed out before. I just want to point out the orientation of white matter in the cerebellum because it's going to be the same as the orientation of white matter in the cerebrum. So in the brain, you have the cerebellum and the cerebrum that have gray matter on the outside and white matter on the inside. Gray matter is primarily made up of dendrites and cell bodies, which is not surrounded by myelin, which is a fatty substance that doesn't stain and is much lighter in appearance. Anywhere where there's white matter, that's most likely axons, axons specifically that are myelinated or contain a fatty substance around them to help speed up conduction or neuron signaling. So in the cerebrum and the cerebellum, you have internal white matter, outer gray matter. In the spinal cord, however, it's the complete opposite. If we were looking at a cross section of the spinal cord, we'd see inner gray matter and then outer white matter. So just a couple of differences there, just so that you're aware of what you're looking at with some of the color changes. And then here is another structure that doesn't use numbers, but we're looking at a sheep brain with the words attached. So again, arbor vitae, cerebellum itself, cerebrum, corpus callosum, fornix, we can see the covering to a lateral ventricle, septum pellucidum, optic chiasma below the hypothalamus, which is below the thalamus, hence hypo, a prefix that means below, so the word itself means below the thalamus and its location is such. Above or upon the thalamus is the epithalamus. Epi is a prefix that means above or upon. And the pineal gland is another name for the epithalamus. We're seeing the superior and inferior colliculi pointed out. We're seeing just two of the four bumps that make up the corpora quadrumina, which include the superior and inferior colliculi. Moving down, we're seeing other structures in the midbrain which are in front of the pons, and then the medulla oblongata, which is continuous with the spinal cord. Again, the arbor vitae is going to also be known as cerebellar white matter. And the opening to the fourth ventricle is this triangular indentation at the base of the cerebellum. The opening to the third ventricle is located just above the thalamus, right here in this space. In this view, they've taken a sheep brain, they've taken the anterior structure and pulled it away from a posterior structure. So they've pulled the cerebellum and the brainstem away from the cerebrum so that we can see parts of the midbrain. We're seeing all four bumps finally that make up the corpora quadrumina. The top two are the superior colliculi. The bottom two are the inferior colliculi. Again, these four structures are the visual and auditory reflex centers of the brain, and together they're the corpora quadrumina. Also, when you pull back this part of the midbrain, you can see the pineal gland, which is part of the diencephalon. Pineal gland, also known as the epithalamus. We can also see the vermis, which are lateral conduction pathways that connect both lateral lobes of the cerebellum. And then we'll look over the cranial nerves quickly. I'm just gonna read through them give you some clues about prefixes and suffixes, then we'll move on and look at a chart. Here we have cranial nerves 1 through 12, so you have 12 cranial nerves. The nerves are the olfactory nerve, optic nerve, oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, trigeminal nerve, abducens nerve, facial nerve, vestibulocochlear nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, vagus nerve, accessory nerve, and hypoglossal nerve. Now take the facial nerve for what it says. It's going to be involved in something facial and that would be muscle movement in your face. If we look, for example, at vestibulocochlear, anything vestibular is talking about balance. The cochlea is an organ of hearing. So the vestibulocochlear nerve has to do with balance and hearing. Anything that has glosso or glossal as a prefix or suffix for it has something to do with the tongue. And then pharyngeal, comes from the word pharynx, and your pharynx is your throat. So take the prefixes and the suffixes for what they are and use them for clues. 
Other things you might just recognize from hearing words throughout AMP1 are optic, has something to do with vision, olfactory, something to do with smell, and then oculomotor, something to do with movement of the eye. In fact, four of the six muscles that move the eye are controlled by the oculomotor nerve. Here's a chart with a little bit more information. In green are sensory functions of each optic nerve, sorry, each cranial nerve, including the optic nerve, which is solely sensory. The olfactory nerve is also solely sensory, just like the vestibular cochlear nerve. Then you have in red, the motor functions. And I was talking about the oculomotor nerve controlling four of the six muscles that move the eye. The other two optic nerves, so I keep saying optic, the other two cranial nerves that move the eye are the trochlea and the abducens. So the oculomotor, trochlea, and abducens cranial nerves are responsible for motor movement of the eye. Four out of the six are controlled by the oculomotor nerve, and the superior oblique muscle is controlled by the trochlear nerve, and the lateral rectus muscle by the abducens. So those are just some examples of how you could read this chart. All the cranial nerves also have Roman numerals. I do suggest, yeah, I definitely do suggest that you learn the Roman numerals. But for your upcoming exam, I will go ahead and give you a clue. I will have both the Roman numeral and the name. All right, one of our last topics is going to be the ear. There's three parts to the ear. You have an outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The outer ear goes from the ear itself to the tympanum or your eardrum. The eardrum is also known as the tympanic membrane. And from there to where the stapes sits on this membrane for the inner ear, that's going to be the middle ear. And then the inner ear is gonna go from that membrane to the vestibular cochlear nerve, but it mainly includes the organs of hearing, the cochlea, and the organs of balance. The organs of balance include the semicircular canals and the vestibule. There is a vestibular nerve and a cochlear nerve that combine to become the vestibular cochlear nerve that sends, visual, that sends information about balance from the vestibular nerve and hearing from the cochlear nerve to the brain. <coughs> Another structure you want to look at is the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube is also known as the pharyngotympanic tube and the auditory tube. You want to know that the eustachian tube is a part of the middle ear. And other structures in the middle ear are three bones. The three bones as a group are called the auditory ossicles. The malleus, incus, and stapes are the names of the three auditory ossicles, again, small bones of the middle ear. They also have names related to their shape. You have the hammer for the malleus, anvil for the incus, and stapes is also called the stirrup. But the group name again is the auditory ossicles and they're three small bones of the middle ear. And then our structures we're gonna see in the external or outer ear is the ear itself, also called the pinna, and the ear canal. The ear canal is also called the external acoustic meatus or the auditory canal. So if we do a quick list just from what we can see on this image of structures in the outer ear, we would say ear canal and pinna. Structures in the middle ear would be the auditory ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes, and the eustachian tube, also known as the pharyngotympanic tube. In the inner ear, we would include the organs of balance, including the vestibule and the semicircular canals, and we'd include the cochlea which is the organ of hearing, and at least parts of the vestibular and cochlear nerve, which become the vestibulocochlear nerve, which goes to the brain and brings that hearing and balance information to the brain. The part of the stapes that leads to the membrane that connects the middle to the inner ear is the oval part of the stapes that hits the oval window. So that's one way to remember what window leads from the middle ear to the inner ear, it's the oval window because it's the oval part of the stirrup or stapes that meets that window. We can see a sac-like structure here. This is the vestibule. 
we can see three half circles. Those are the semicircular canals. And we can see a snail shell or spiral structure. This is the cochlea. The cochlea contains receptors for hearing. And the vestibule and the semicircular canals contain receptors for balance. Here's that group name for the malleus, incus, and stapes. Auditory ossicles. Remember, they're located in the middle ear, so don't let this image be a little disorienting. And they're located in the middle ear with the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube is going to equalize pressure between your pharynx and your middle ear. So that tube leads from your middle ear to your throat. Your pharynx is another term for your throat. The types of receptors we have in the inner ear are hair cells, which have actually tiny hairs called stereocilia on them that respond to fluid movement. And that fluid movement can create an action potential or electrical signal that can be conducted to the brain via the vestibulocochlear nerve, which you see here sometimes is called the auditory nerve. The tympanic membrane is going to be the boundary between the outer and middle ear, and it's also known as the eardrum or the tympanum. And last but not least, we have our taste buds. Our taste buds are sensory cells located on the bumps of the tongue. Another term for the bumps on your tongue are papillae. You have four types of papillae, fungiform, vallate, sometimes called circumvallate, foliate, and filiform. It's important to know which of these bumps does not have taste buds, and that would be your filiform papillae. Your filiform papillae are bumps on your tongue that do not contain sensory cells called taste buds. And that's pretty much a wrap for your study guide for your final lab exam in Biology 2113 AMP1. Please let me know if you have any questions. Please send them via email or text. I'm here to help, and I hope this was informative.